to a human I can depend on to bring me happy. Well, hello again, Trekkies, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 3 of A Captain's Log, your one-stop source for 56 years of Star Trek history and history in the making. I'm your host, Brian Kreutz, joined, as always, by the one and only Deanna Troy Counselor Clothed, Lily Fox Loom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brian. It's amazing that we're now up to our 16th episode. We started off less than a year ago as a dream, and now here we are, broadcasting onto 13 TV stations throughout America and across the world on Roku. Yes, and it's all because of you, our dear viewers. You know, I always knew Star Trek fans are the greatest fans in the world, mm -hmm. but your loyalty and support for us has made us both realize that even more. Absolutely. Hey, where's Raj? You know, the one and only time we're on the bridge, Raj isn't here, and he's probably in our quarter. Oh, of course. Raj, there he is on the view screen. Sorry I'm late, everyone. I was out trying to negotiate a sponsorship with a cocoa company. Wait, Raj, you have a cocoa company? I thought you realized after all this time that cocoa was a play on words as a co-co-host, not cocoa served in bottles. Computer! Cocoa in a bottle, please! Have you lost your Android mind? <laughs> well, Raj, I sure hope that XO3 isn't having all the issues we are here with understanding how our world can work together as humanity to make a better place. You know, at least you're employed by making money on a Coco sponsorship. Mm -hmm. I went back home for Christmas and we have a robust economy. In fact, Star Trek merchandise was flying off the shelves in the stores. Especially the Roger Corby action figure. He's my dad. Well, we have a very exciting show for you Trekkies today. It's just a few minutes away. We'll have our interview with our frequent Star Trek actress and stuntwoman, Patricia Tallman. Ooh. <gasps> Will she teach me how to do stunts? I think she might be willing to give us a few tips on that. But first, we have a lot of items for the viewers in yes. the news department. Yes, months of new Star Trek news to report on our show. The new animated series Star Trek Prodigy is up and running. Season 1 has been released and there's news that it's been renewed for another season. For more of us to be able to look towards characters like Dahl, Jankum Pog, Admiral Janeway or Captain Janeway's hologram mm -hmm. more specifically, all 10 first season episodes are available on Paramount+. Plus. Many fans of Prodigy are adults, I'm sure of it. And for our Star Trek Discovery fans, do not despair! News of a season 5 is official for Discovery, which also airs on Paramount+. Plus. Well, during the downtime between seasons here on A Captain's Log, the most publicized Star Trek occurrence was 90-year-old William Shatner becoming the oldest person ever to go into outer space. So cool. It was so awesome. Now, the October 13th mission is now chronicled in a one-hour-long documentary titled Shatner in Space. Now, the film is already available on Amazon Prime in the USA, Canada, UK, Australia, and New Zealand, with more countries on the way. Wow. A Captain's Log returns in a moment. Welcome back to A Captain's Log. But right now, it's time for our interview guest. Brian, what can you tell us about her? Yes, our guest is Patricia Tallman. She's a diverse talent with a very accomplished career in the film industry, dating back more than 40 years now. Wow. She's probably best known in the industry as a stunt woman, performing stunts in dozens of episodes of three Star Trek series. You know them. Mm -hmm. Star Trek The Next Generation, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and Star Trek Voyager, plus the 1994 movie, Star Trek Generations. And she also performed various roles in those productions. We are grateful to have Patricia Tolman. Patricia, thank you for joining us here on A Captain's Log. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here, absolutely. Tell us about your early days of getting into performing as an actress and stunt work. Was it when you were growing up or did you jump in head first after you were out here in Southern California? No, I, I started when I was a kid and I always loved to write my own scripts and create little vignettes for my family and my cousins and I, we would, we would write and write songs, not even just scripts, but songs and dances and perform them for our family. We were really out there. <laughs> 
<laughs> my favorite show was Dark Shadows uh, and Star Trek. Those, though, and so we would write scripts and act around those two shows, horror and science fiction. So is it any wonder that my career has been like <laughs> in those parameters? I think not. We have very powerful minds, kids. What you focus on, you, you create. So yeah, absolutely. That was, an, that was an amazing realization when I kind of pulled that out and realized, oh my gosh, I, I totally created this career in science fiction and horror. I'm sure you work frequently with stunt coordinator Dennis Danger Madelone throughout The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager. Can you tell us about an interesting stunt or some memories of working with him? I was so blessed to be introduced to Dennis shortly after I arrived in Los Angeles. And he was looking for um, another stunt woman to work on the stunt team for, for the Star Trek shows. I just happened to be the right size, five foot nine. I was slender in those days. And so I could double a lot of actresses. He brought me in as a nondescript stunt, which is called on the, on the call sheet, it says ND stunt, which means you don't have to be any particular type, but he just wanted to try me out, right? See how I do. And so he put me in on that, in, as that security officer, I pretty much show up on the bridge and then take a phaser hit and die. <laughs> that was about it. And I laid on the floor of 10 forward for a week as a body because <laughs> the rest of the action took place all around the dead bodies and 10 forward. Anyway, um, I, I was, I did an okay job evidently because he brought me back and uh, as he saw what he could of me, he trusted me and we worked really, really well together. So I just kept getting gig after gig. I, I mean, that's, this is just one of those um, super blessed moments in your career where you end up working for somebody who then can give you job after job after job. I've done over 50 episodes of Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager. Um, we, we finished up in, on um, Next Generation, and we, as, as Next Generation, we knew that, that the show was coming to an end, but they were starting Deep Space Nine. It overlapped for a while, but... Dennis got to go into Deep Space Nine as the creating stunt coordinator. He brought a few of us along with him to be the originating stunt team. And um, they cast their Naw visitor. At first, they were, they were talking to Michelle Forbes as Ensign Rowe from Next Generation. And they were going to, she was going to be the lead on Deep Space Nine. Uh, but she decided she didn't want to stay in Star Trek. Uh, uh, and I was crushed because I was her stunt double on Next Generation. And I thought, shoot, you know. But then they hired Nana Visitor, who was, we both had short red hair. We both had the same sort of figure, you know. It was like amazing, amazing. I was so lucky. And I also ended up doubling Terry Farrell. And we created a, a lot of the fighting technique. In fact, we helped with Dennis's vision was, were these Klingon weapons that then the prop and weapons guy created, and then we created the fighting style for those weapons. So why would these weapons be shaped this way? And how would you fight if this weapon was had this attribute, you know? So it was really fascinating and so much fun. So, I mean, where, where does that happen in life that you get to be part of an iconic creation team? Just nuts. I'm it so is. lucky. <laughs> Were you a Star Trek fan prior to beginning work on The Next Generation back in 1992? I was uh, brought up by a, a father who loved television and he would watch you know, all these iconic shows. Um, back in those days, and we're talking the 60s and the 70s, you know, you had one TV set, if you were lucky, there were three channels and you watched the TV show when it was on. That's it. <laughs> you didn't watch reruns. You didn't have, you know, VCRs. So um we would watch whatever dad was watching because that's your choice you get to watch what dad's watching and he loves star trek it took me a while to kind of get it i was come on i was just in the single digits i think when we were start just started that show so uh, i mean i was small but i was fascinated by the idea of space and i i loved the character of spock for some reason <laughs> spock was just 
mysterious and always in control. And of course, I loved Uhura being a beautiful woman. I didn't really get the black white thing. That was not a worry in my world. We were in an interracial neighborhood in the suburbs of Chicago. So that was part of my existence. But as a woman, as a little girl, seeing a woman in power on the command bridge was, was something that made an impression on me that I didn't realize until much later. But I love the show. I love the idea that women could be, could be equal mm -hmm. and have the same uh, power as a guy, you know, because there were different women in that show. There were also the green sexy ladies. So <laughs> that was fascinating to me too, not having any idea what that meant or what that was. <laughs> and then it went away, right? And it didn't come back till a little later obviously next generation, but the reruns started coming back and I could start to watch them from a teenage and then young adult point of view. And then I really loved it too. What has it been like to interact with the Star Trek fan base over the years? Tell us maybe an interesting story or two about one of those particular fans that you love. First, I would say that just being, um, being part of fandom at all is an enormous privilege enormous to have and I've been so blessed because I've been on these shows that have these great fan bases whether it was a horror thing or a, a science fiction thing um, or something like Jurassic Park which is kind of fantasy I don't you know just this there's there's these shows that I kept stepping into and ending up in these big groups of fandom that was overwhelming at first. And my first taste of it was with the horror convention. So uh, like 1990, we did Night of the Living Dead. It was after that, you know? And I was, I, I was just kind of blown away by the whole thing and not sure what to, to do. But then when, by the time I ended up in uh, Babylon 5 was the first time I started be, being put in front of science fiction fans. And then, because I didn't, first of all, I didn't think that anybody noticed me on Star Trek. I wasn't, you know, but Babylon 5 was where I started being asked to be a guest in front of science fiction fans. And they would mention the Star Trek shows I was in. <laughs> what? How did you even know that? Um, yeah, I mean, it runs the gamut. For the most part, I would say I am... I, and I think the fans know this, that, that I am, I love my community so much. I'm a huge nerd. Started with Star Trek, have my own versions of nerddom. And so I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm also a nerd and I got to be lucky enough to be on some of the shows we nerd out about. So I nerd out about people on my show or people on Star Trek. I, you know, <laughs> it's so weird to be on the show and I'm nerdy out <laughs> I was uh, I was a Romulan um, in Timescape. I've been a Romulan a couple times, but that one is what I was a. Uh, it was almost a two parter or something. So I was a Romulan for a long time. I kind of looked like Liza Minnelli with jaundice, you know. I, I just sort of yellow and lots of makeup. For some reason, they put a lot of makeup on me. Lots of eye makeup. Very glamorous Romulan. But I ran around uh, the sets of Next Generation and took pictures of myself on all the sets That's because. So cool nerd he <laughs> had to do it that's why i i have a book full of these pictures because i was really active with my camera even though we weren't supposed to have cameras on the sets in those days right. uh I, I did it anyway and um i put them all all those pictures in my book <laughs> okay patricia tell us about this babylon 5 and some of the star trek book memories that you have out there available and where can the fans get this book it's uh, a book that you had behind the scenes pictures and it's titled Pleasure Thresholds, Patricia Tallman's Babylon 5 Memoir. Tell us a little bit more. I got a call one day from, and this woman says, hi, my name's Jacqueline Easton. I am the publisher for B5 Books. And Joe Straczynski, who created Babylon 5, said that you'd be the perfect person to talk to because he said you were really obnoxious on the set with your camera. <laughs> And you'd have all the photos we need for to do. We need to do a more fan friendly book. So she assigned um, an editor to me 
who is now a dear friend, Jason Davis, and we created a book based on the five years I was on Babylon 5 and all the shows I was doing in between, which was Star Trek and Jurassic Park and all these other shows that I did. And yeah, I was just, I had all these photos. We, we curated it down to about 350, 60 photos. And, um, and I wrote the stories of what was going on behind all these photos that we took. Um, if you can find it on b5events.com slash store, uh, we, I, I put it on online um, for the pandemic because I was gonna be doing more out in, in conventions, but got shut down. So it's online, um, but I'm selling my house and I'm moving. So if you guys are interested in the book, go check it out on b5events.com slash store. It's 35 bucks. Um, I send it from my house autographed. So you can get it now, a physical copy autographed. You were heavily involved in Jurassic Park as Laura Dern's stunt double. What were your experiences like on that movie? I tell you, that was quite an experience, kids, because Spielberg pushing the edge as he does, we didn't, we didn't know what we were making. I, I don't think on any movie that I made, have I ever been involved with anything that I realized it was going to, well, we didn't know what we were making. We didn't know we were making Forrest Gump. We, you know, we didn't know it was going to do that. So we're just doing a movie, you know, with some cool people. In it. We hope everyone crosses their fingers, but no one ever knows when a movie is going to hit or not. You just don't know. So Jurassic Park really was actually sketchy because it's like dinosaurs and mm, this is book. And it's like, okay, we're going to take a Michael Crichton book and turn it. Okay, yeah, good luck with that. Laura Dern, awesome. She's my favorite actress who I've ever doubled for. She is so real, so charming, so lovely. Uh, I can't, there's not enough words to say how kind she is. I have worked with so many actresses and big, big names. And it's really disappointing when they turn out to be, you know, biatches. It's such a, it's so sad because you're given everything. So why you don't need to be a biatch. Laura was a queen. She's gorgeous, lovely, wonderful. And I ran into her many, many, many years and a baby later, you know, older, thicker. And she took one look at me. She's talking to Julianne Moore. She looks over Julianne Moore's head. Julianne's very short. And she looks and she goes, What's your show? So good to see you. And I'm like, what? She recognized me because anytime she ever saw me, I'm wearing her hair. I'm wearing her wig. She never saw me out of makeup looking like her. So that was amazing to me that she recognized me, spotted me, interrupted Julianne Moore <laughs> and said hi to give me a hug. That's the kind of lady she is. I write about, I, I do think I have that in Pleasure Thresholds, my, one of the main gags that I did for her in, in, that, in Jurassic Park. But I, I, let me tell you what we saw as the dinosaurs, okay? So one of my favorite nights was um, we are, we are doing the Jeep when the Jeep is, we rescue the Jeff Bloom, Goldblum character and, um, the T-Rex is in the jungle. We hear him, right. And he's coming for us. And we're trying to get everybody out before <laughs> another person gets chomped. So Spielberg is directing us. First of all, huge thrill. Spielberg's using my name. What? <laughs> you know, that's crazy. Right. I, I look like Laura Dern, but he's saying, hey, Pat. And, and so he says, your eye line, the meaning where I'm going to look for this shot is here because the T-Rex is tall. So how they manage that was they have a stick and this big stick is metered off black, white, black, white, black, white to give the special effects guys exactly how big this thing is. And on the top of this big, like 15, 20 foot stick is a round cardboard circle and in the middle of the circle somebody put a happy face with teeth that's the t-rex's head <laughs> so he said all right uh when i say one here's your eye line so look at the face up there and the camera truck is driving just in front of us off the nose of our jeep so then spielberg screams okay pat one then two and now three and when i when we say three i'm watching the head come down the head there's nothing there right and and they explode the fx guys explode uh basically a four foot piece of telephone pole bam and that knocks the jeep up into the air at the same time these effects guys collapse 
the inside of the Jeep door. So it looks like this invisible T-Rex has hit the Jeep with its head and I have to get my legs out of the way. It's amazing what these guys do. A captain's log returns in a moment. Welcome back to a captain's log. Patricia, what are some of the most challenging Star Trek stunts that you have performed in your long, illustrious career? Star Trek, um, we had a lot of fun, and the challenging bits for doing stunts on Star Trek were to make them interesting because we're basically in a ship. You know, it's not like we can drive off a cliff into a waterfall or something, you know, dramatic like that. <laughs> we're having, we have fights. I was doubling the gnaw in Deep Space Nine. They're in a cave. They're on a very narrow ledge. There's frequent earthquakes or something in Chicks, and this earthquake happens, and Kira falls to her knees and then almost falls over the edge and somebody grabs her and pulls her back up so she doesn't actually fall when we did the stunt i had a wire on me because it's really practically impossible certainly impossible for me to hold my body weight if i were to fall like that on, on, with my fingertips on the ledge of something i wouldn't be able to do that yeah. so we had a wire on a harness so that when i slipped and almost fell and i'm holding on like this um, there's a wire supporting my weight and then the stuntman can help pull me back up and it looks like she's saved, right? However, what happened was the wire broke. We were all set up for that. Joe Murphy was standing down by the boxes. Uh, it was only about 12 feet high. You may say, oh, it's only 12 feet high. But the problem with a shortfall is that you don't have time to correct your body in the air. So you can land on your neck. You could land on your leg wrong and shatter the whole leg. He knocked my legs out from under me so that I landed flat on my back on these boxes that were stacked with a, a furniture pad on it to, to soften the edges of the boxes. And that mean, meant I landed safely. I wasn't going to hurt myself like that. So I landed flat. Nothing was, was impacted um, in a harmful way. But I had just had that experience on Deep Space Nine. And I said, I, don't, I, want, I want redundant cables. And the stunt co co coordinator was kind of like, oh, come on, really? And I said, no. He said, he said, okay, we'll put an extra cable. I said, I want two. I want two extra. I want three cables on me. And don't you know, one of them broke. <laughs> I mean, if yeah. I had not had that experience. Wow. Yeah. You're in 47 episodes of Babylon 5 and played Lita Alexander, a regular cast member during the last two of the five seasons. What kind of following do you have from fans of that series? I, I want to credit Joe Straczynski for creating the show and the writing because that's what made it so extraordinary. You can act your pants off, but if you have a terrible script, it only does so much, right? right. <laughs> but when you have a magnificent script or a series, then it makes your job easy. So I'll say that for at first, we had an easy job. Mm -hmm. And so stepping into it, um, I feel like that the, the deck was stacked in my favor. But the fans have been so incredibly loving and very um, loyal. It's, what is it, 28 years or somewhere in that, that spot? Now, holy smokes, Crazy. some people are still fans of the show. Mm -hmm. What? You know, that's amazing to me. And again, so grateful. Patricia, thank you so much for being with Brian and I here on A Captain's Log. I know we truly enjoyed your stories and the memories that you've shared with us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And fans, Lily and I greatly appreciate you being with us here each and every week on A Captain's Log for the latest Star Trek news and interviews. So happy, my old friend. I'm glad you've manifested yourself into a human I can depend on to bring me happy. Ooh.